Breakfast with the Bible. Something to munch on. Welcome to Episode 4 of Breakfast with the Bible, a podcast where we work our way through the Bible one bite at a time. My name is Dan, and today we are studying John 1, 14 through 18, which reads, The Word became flesh and lived among us. We saw His glory, such glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him. He cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, for He was before me. From His fullness we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The one and only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared Him. Here are my notes from John 1, 14 through 18. I had a light bulb in verse 14. The eternal Word, Jesus, became a man of flesh and blood and lived among us. And we have learned that He is God, and all things were made through Him, from verse 3. So now he comes down into his creation as a human. It really is pretty amazing when you think about the God of the universe choosing to leave his place of glory to come and live among us. All right, I had a question mark in verse 14. What exactly does John mean by glory here? They have seen his glory. I think we all kind of understand it kind of means his greatness But let's dig into this word a little more because Jesus is not just another prophet or Jewish rabbi teacher. They have seen in him glory as of the only Son from the Father. Jesus is from God the Father and he is God. His glory is that of God's glory because he is equal to God. With the word glory, John was getting at the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. We clearly see God in the man Jesus both his presence and his nature. Like Isaiah prophesied of Jesus in Isaiah 4.17 and is quoted in Matthew 1.23 when it was being fulfilled, he would be born of a virgin and called Emmanuel. That name means God with us. When Moses spoke with God, his face shone like the sun and people couldn't even look directly at him until it faded, so he wore a veil. That was God's greatness his glory affecting Moses. In Jesus, the glory of God is seen. His character, his greatness, his goodness. Just as God's presence dwelt on the earth in the Ark of the Covenant, when people interacted with Jesus as a man, they were seeing God. I think it also has to do with how John wrote, full of grace and truth. Ephesians 2.8, you'll remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith. But what is grace? In Christ, God has given us something we don't deserve. That's grace. Some call it unmerited favor. This free gift of God, eternal life through faith in Jesus. Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's the true light from verse 9. He's from the one true God and in him is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life from John 14, 6. And from verse 4, in him was life and the life was was the light of men. I love seeing how different parts of the Bible work together like that. Jesus brought the grace and truth of God. He was full of it like he was full of the Holy Spirit. For me, I saw a light bulb in verse 14. When John writes in verse 14, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, it's pretty special. Let's talk more about that as I have it here as a light bulb and before I was answering the question from verse 14. But it's amazing for John to write of seeing Jesus' glory because the author of this book was an eyewitness of Jesus. He was one of his 12 disciples, an apostle of Jesus. He lived and traveled with him for three years. He even describes himself in this book as the disciple whom Jesus loved. We'll see it first in John 13, 23, but then in many other places. So when he says, we have seen his glory, he really means it. 
he saw the glory of God in Jesus walking the earth as a man, performing miracles, living without sin, preaching good news to the poor and captives, healing for the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, deliverance to those who are crushed. I'm getting these from Luke 4.18. John was there at the transfiguration where he glimpsed Jesus' divine nature being revealed. Jesus shone with an unearthly, intense white glow. That scene isn't in the book of John, but it's in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They generally share a similar narrative sequence with many of the same stories of Jesus' life. And it is just so cool to me to read this from a man who knew Jesus really well as a devoted friend and disciple. He truly saw Jesus' glory. Okay, I had a question mark in verse 15. The way John writes of John the Baptist testifying about Jesus in this verse can be a bit of a tongue twister. So let's unravel it. Uh, it reads, John 1.15, John testified about him. He cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, for he was before me. So Jesus started his ministry after John the Baptist, in that way, he comes after John. Yet Jesus, who comes after John, has surpassed John because he was before John. In other words, Jesus has more power and authority and is more important than John. Also, Jesus was before John as the eternal word from the way John opened this book. Jesus was with God and he was God. Before John was ever born, as miraculous as that was with John's dad seeing an angel and going mute and prophesying of John as a witness to Jesus' coming, before all of that, Jesus has always existed as God. I think that's why this is my favorite book of the Bible. Even in these first 15 verses, John is just packing in so many amazing truths about Jesus, and it puts me in a state of awe about Jesus. Of course, I know he's my Savior. I know he is God. But to read about these truths makes the glory of Jesus shine to me as the life and the light of men that shines in the darkness from verses 4 and 5. This is also why I love this method of reading the scriptures, because when I'm reading to look for light bulbs, question marks, and arrows, it slows me down and helps me think more deeply about what I'm reading, and it makes me read the text multiple times. Okay, I had a question in verse 16. What did John mean about Jesus when he wrote, From his fullness we all received grace upon grace? I think it's a little hard to get the meaning out of that word fullness in our modern context. My mind just goes to like, is my cup of coffee full, you know? A tool I have found helpful to do word studies with that's free is BibleGateway.com and the Mount's Reverse Interlinear New Testament. Sounds like a mouthful, but it's in choosing what translation of the Bible you're just using on the website. Scroll down to the M's and the Mount's Reverse Interlinear New Testament. It shows the Bible in English with the original Greek it was written in under it. So I went to John 1.16 and clicked on the word fullness. And then a great little dictionary pops up and gives me way more meaning of this word. It was talking about something filling up what is lacking, overflowing, performing in like a perfect way, and many other things. These things make me think of how after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, all of us were born into sin and we are all sinners. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our relationship with God is broken because of our lack of holiness. We are not full of holiness. Then comes Jesus, who never sinned, as the one who fills up a deficiency. Not only did he live a perfect life, making him the perfect spotless sacrifice, but he then chose to go to the cross in our place and pay for our sins by dying the death we deserve for our sins. God then accepted Jesus' sacrifice and raised him from the dead, approving his good work for the salvation of all who would believe in Jesus. So now in Jesus, we have eternal life, or you could say abundant life. Later in uh, chapter 10 of John, Jesus will say in John 10, 10, 
The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and may have it abundantly. Back to verse 16. It says, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. I think that's John's way of writing full, ultimate, overflowing, insane amounts of grace. Grace upon grace. Remember how grace means unmerited favor. We're given something that we have not earned and do not deserve. Things like salvation and forgiveness of our sins through faith in Jesus. Okay, I had a light bulb in verse 17. It's in this passage that John finally names this person he's been talking about and sharing amazing truths about. In verse 17, he names him as Jesus Christ. And verse 18 gives us even more certainty that it is this Jesus who has made God known. Okay, a question from verse 17. What does John mean by the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ? The first five books of the Bible written by Moses are often called the law, among many other things. In it, we read about how God called a people from among all the nations to himself through Moses, the Israelites. They were enslaved in Egypt, and God miraculously rescued them with many signs and wonders. And then at Mount Sinai, Moses went up the mountain and received the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. Summed up, they're all about loving God and loving others, which is what Jesus said are the greatest commandments when asked in Matthew 22, 36-40. The law is a standard God gave his people to live by so they would be more like him and reflect him and his character to the nations. They failed at this, but that was also the point of the law. God requires perfect, sinless holiness from us to be in relationship with him. And yet, none of us can attain that no matter how hard we try. So, the law is meant to show us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We can't fulfill the law. There's that word like fullness in verse 16. But Christ did, and through our faith in him, it is as if we have fulfilled the law. If we have repented of our sin and are following Jesus as our Lord and Savior, or you could say if we are in Christ, then when God looks at us, he sees not our sin, but Jesus' perfect righteousness given to us. This is that grace and truth in verse 17 that we touched on earlier while talking about verse 14, which also mentions grace and truth. Remember, when a biblical author repeats something, that's their way of highlighting it for you or making it stand out. So the law brought an awareness of the eternal spiritual death we are all headed to without faith in God, and later, Jesus. And Jesus brought grace and truth. This is favor from God we did not deserve, and the truth about who Jesus is revealed in himself, and the true way of salvation by faith in him. Amazing. I am so thankful that John wrote this letter to reveal the grace and truth of Jesus to us. All right, I had a question mark in verse 18. What did John mean by the only God who is at the Father's side? The first pass of reading verse 18 left me a little confused. And usually I would just kind of take a split second to realize I wasn't sure exactly what it means, then move on and keep reading. That's why I love the Swedish method. You likely are already tracking with what John meant from other things we've talked about in this chapter, but let's get into it and clear it up. So, it says, John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The one and only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. I'm used to reading the Bible in the ESV translation, which doesn't have in the bosom of the Father, but talks about Jesus being at the Father's side. This verse might not have tripped you up, depending on the translation you're reading it in, but even the ESV was a little confusing at first glance, because it talks about Jesus and the Father as the only God, and at first glance it sounds like he's writing about the same person, but then you realize he's not. That's kind of the point though, right? Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, one God in three persons, as the Holy Trinity. 
The other thing I wanted to understand better was what John meant in writing, Jesus has declared God. The second part of verse 18 in the W.E.B. translation reads, The one and only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Other translations talk about Jesus revealing God to us or making the Father known. That cleared it up for me. When I even looked the word up in the Greek, it had those same two meanings among others. It can be super helpful to read confusing verses in different translations. And my favorite place to do this is at BibleGateway.com, which is free. Again, I'm using the W-E-B because it's copyright free, but I've been happy to see it's often pretty close to the ESV. Finally, I just want to remember what John wrote earlier in our passage today. In verse 14, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John is writing about Jesus making God known there too just like verse 18 in the end of our passage. Pretty cool. Also, another place we see John repeating a theme of Jesus coming to earth as a man, making God known, revealing God and his glory. That's the end of my notes for John 1, 14 through 18. So now please use this time to pray and reflect on what we just talked about in this passage as I play this brief song. Okay, we've hit the end of episode four. To prepare for episode five, please read John 1, 19 through 23, and then write some notes down using the Swedish method. And if you're not sure about what that is, go to the website and click on the about page. It would also be super cool if you have comments to share about today's passage or the podcast for you to go to the website and drop them in the comments section, or you can do that on YouTube. You can visit the website for this podcast at breakfastwiththebible.com, where you're going to find links to buy merch and ways to support the show. You can click on the coffee cup to buy me a coffee, and it has one-time or monthly support options, and those come with extra bonus content. And also, if you could leave a review and a rating on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice, That would be great to just help me get the show to more people. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time when we'll be studying John 1, 19-23. Music by Dan Absalonson.